Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Disrupted Dialogue. My name is Thomas Cotton and I'm your host. Today we have our grand finale show, uh, which includes all the ladies who have been in the first six shows. They are amazing. They have uh, shared a lot of their, their life with us and the things that they have overcome, the challenges they face, but the inspiration that they are. And I'm so grateful that we have them all back. Today we have with us, joining us, Jesse Mabry. Uh, Daphne Patterson, Lucretia Doyle, Lisa Humans, uh, Walisha Wilson, and Dina Dickerson. Um, if you don't know their bios, go back and watch their original podcast where we lay out their bios. I'll also include a link in the chat so you can look at their bios. But today we're just going to jump right in to some of the things that we want to talk about. We've heard their experiences. We want to capture their hearts, though, on how we can better support women mothers and caregivers who've been impacted by the justice system. I also want to discuss the areas that they've all shared that they've overcome is trauma. We all deal with trauma. And so their inspiration of overcoming traumatic experiences and how they continue to work through that process um, can help a lot of people to move forward. So to kick off the show today, I'm going to just drop some questions in there. We're going to have a panel discussion. All the ladies are going to be able to share their heart, but we really, really, really want to get to some solutions. Um, so the first question that I'm going to say to just, first of all, let me just say welcome, ladies, to Disruptive Dialogue. I appreciate you all being here and being able to share your heart. Welcome. Yeah. So when it comes to the injustice that you see, the social injustice that you see that's driving a lot of the things we're talking about right now, driving mm -hmm. the prison industrial complex, driving um, the the prison school to prison pipeline, the social injustices that we see, what do you feel are some solutions that you've been working on that you have thought about and ways that we can get behind to look at how we can solve these things from the cause aspect, not just the effect? Um, I think one of the biggest issues is, for one, we need to get out of a lock them up mentality. Um, a large majority of the women, particularly who are incarcerated, are there um, out of some type of trauma rooted issue, whether it's substance use, whether they're in abusive relationships. I mean, my God, you are locking women up for life for killing men who have raped them or who have trafficked them or who have beat them for years. And oftentimes these are women who have gone to the police to ask for help. These are people who have reached out and said, this is what I need. I'm addicted to drugs. I need rehabilitation. But because they don't have insurance or you don't have a place that won't take them, that's all about money, they've been turned away. So a lot of time women do what they do, whether it's, um, you know, get into sex work or they get, you know, get caught up in trafficking or they're in abusive relationships. And we're not even going to talk about women who uh, go to jail because they take drug charges that their man should have taken and they take the rap for that man. So we, for one, we need to get out of a lock them up mentality because, and then turn around and be confused as to why our children are going to muck because you done took all their mamas out the house, you know? And like I said, fathers are just as critical to children as mothers. But I can remember a time when my mama used to say, daddy, um, daddy, maybe mama's baby, whether daddy leave or not, mama's going to always have to be there for that baby. So taking uh, taking the mom out of a child's life is it, it makes everything into a downfall. But I'm not surprised by that because the prison system is a business. Uh, it is to the point now where about two thirds of all prisons have lockup quotas written in their contract that says as a contract, you have to keep so many of your beds filled. So literally they are incentivized to fill those beds. So once you get out of a mentality of lock them up first, then we can address the such thing as alternative sentences. Um, when you are have a you're sending a woman to jail because she's gone into a Walmart and stole chicken and pampers, and your first choice is to send her to jail as opposed to saying, "Well, ma'am, we have a place where we can get you some pampers and we can get you some food assistance." Now we're not going to not hold you accountable because you did steal something, but when you're sentencing people to prison for things that they are doing to satisfy a basic need that is criminal in itself. So yes. once we can get out of that mentality and start looking at alternative uh, sentencing sentences that are restorative and 
get out of this money, money mentality, because that's what the system is driven from. It's all about profits. And yeah. everybody is in this tough on crime thing. Georgia's building, you know, getting these three new prisons and everybody think that's a good thing. That's not a good thing, because when you build them, you got to fill them. And who are they going to fill them with? They're going to fill them with us. So when we're doing this stuff and we're just thinking about how this stuff go, locking people up doesn't stop crime. I mean, crime's been going on with one one of I can't remember was Cain or Abel, but one of the brothers killed their own brother. So yeah. people, you know, crime has been going on for a long time and it's going to continue to go on. Locking people yeah. up is not going to resolve that. Giving people what they need to survive will resolve that. People need access to money. People need access to jobs housing, education, people need access to health care. Uh, you know, uh, I think a lady in the other day, I was at the Walgreens and she called the police because the lady was in there um, stealing some some pills or something. Um, why are you calling the police because the lady's trying to steal some medicine? You right. know, that's nothing to call the police because she needs medicine. You know, you, well, that's, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's the way, you know, our society has been trained. You know, let's you know, if they are committing a crime, they need to call the police and do the time. Daphne, you had a comment that you wanted to make. I guess um, just to piggyback on what Wiley's just saying, you know, it's big money. Um, don't forget about the the um, prison industries like Unicor. And, you know, other things, um, when I came home, you know, I let people know, you know, even the 411 operators that used to answer the phone calls were coming from different federal facilities. And you think you talking to somebody who's at an AT&T or a Comcast or whatever answering your question. No, these were actual people that were. Um, you know, housing and facilities, um, people doing the vacation packages that call you saying, oh, stay three nights for 99 days. But these people work on the inside, the factories like Unicor, all that, all that is, is, is money, you know, that that's private money. And, and this is public information that you can go up and look at how much uh, money Unicor and all these places have made you know, each year, you know, off of the different facilities where they may pay, like I said, 50 cent an hour to a person that's working there a full eight hour shift where they should be paying 15 to 20 dollars an hour for a person. More than that. That's paying that. <laughs> yes, I, I just got I lowballed it. But yeah, you um, lowballed it. I worked know, in Unicor it, and we used to make uh, different components for mili mm -hmm. for the military. We yeah. would outbid companies inside, outside on the, the streets. Unicor would put their own bids out. And I mean, there's not many companies on the street that could compete with Unicor when they put a bid out for that. <laughs> you know, to me, that is that is the epitome of slavery that still goes on. It is the reason what drives a lot of our, our system. Um, you know, of course, we know what the 13th Amendment says and so many other things. But the reality is when we start talking about the financial aspect of prison mm -hmm. and the financial aspect of being able to save money on not having tampons, not having certain other things and, and meeting women needs, treating women without dignity. That's something that our society should never be about. You know, when we talk about the World World Health Organization, they talk about these things and their their little treaties with all the countries about how people are supposed to be treated. Um, our country does not adhere to that and will not adhere to that because of our the way we cr control the narrative about prisons and the population. I'm so I'm sorry to just cut you off, but it's no. just like that unicor aspect of it and just the the financial. Um, gain that prisons create for this country mm -hmm. is the only reason why we're able to compete throughout the world. Yeah, and that's, and, that's yeah. one of the things is 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 because they're playing the public. They they're playing on everyday people's fear. Mm -hmm. So so if you say, well, I went to jail, of course, for a speeding ticket or something like jail. But when, the minute you say, oh yeah, I came home from prison, t pr their minds go all the way left. They think the worst of the worst. And so they're playing on that. And so now whatever propaganda that legislate legislators and politicians and stuff raise to continue building new prisons like here in Alabama, getting ready to do one for one point three billion dollars. Like you want to put that much money into a building and not into the rehabilitation, rehabilitative measures of helping individuals. 
Don't know, leave it out, though, Dina. Don't leave it out how she's using that money to build those prisons. Stimulus money that should have gone to Alabama citizens to help them pay their bills. The governor used the Alabama citizens' money to build mm -hmm. a prison. For, and right. that was sent to Alabama people for stimulus checks, and they're using it for prison. We ain't going to leave that out, Kay Ivan. Right. And, and you know, and, 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 and your everyday persons are led to believe that this is something that they should be okay with. Mm -hmm. And it comes from, it's not at my back door. And I, I do believe if it was not for the opioid crisis itself, let's go there, then some of the leniency that's taken place unbeknown to, let's not talk about my 114 years for a drug, being a drug convicted <laughs> person that stemmed from alcoholism. You see, now it's different. It's a disease and we need to, we need to treat it this way and no, we don't need to do it that way. And so even in saying that, we're not addressing the things that actually send persons to prison because we don't want to address the public health crisis that incarceration is too, just like gun violence is a public health crisis. Incarceration is too. And if we don't prepare people to come home to stay at home, then we're going to create that revolving door, which speaks to the recidivism rate, which speaks to the why we need to do this, this, and this, and we're still not putting things in place in order to build people up. But the minute you walk in the back gate, you start getting tore down. You're already tore down. You're already beating yourself up. You're already at your lowest point at this point. And before you know it, you start taking on that identity yourself. And you start becoming exactly what it is you fear to become and exactly what it is that they promote that you are. And that's not the case. They're creating these things. So that's what I have. That's why I hey, know well, profit driven. Go ahead, Walter. That's why I was saying it's all profit driven. Thomas mentioned it earlier. But slavery, we're, we're all about money and we're still in the South that's driven by slavery, which is why we still have currently incarcerated people who are being leased to the highest bidder. When people say slavery doesn't exist, it does exist. These same jobs, all these corporate, there are over 4,000 corporate organizations who currently use prison slave labor. Um, and then those same individuals who can stand up for 16 hours at a time to make your Ikea beds and to make your Starbucks cup coffees and to make your McDonald bags and all this stuff for 16 to 17, eight hours a day, not get paid a zero dime, but can get out and apply those same jobs and get denied employment. And it's mm -hmm. the same thing when it comes to people being bailed out. People are being denied bail, not because their crime was so bad or that if we let them go on bail, they're going to get out and rape and kill again. It's because that person is poor. Me yeah. and Dina can be in the same situation. Dina could be to kill eight or nine folks. And I could have been, been, been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And I didn't even do anything wrong. But because Dina got a million dollars sitting in her account, she can bail out and get out and do what she want to do. But because I'm broke, I'm still stuck in prison and in jail. And so to, everything to me is a revolving door with today being debtor's prison. You, you deserve your time, but you still got to get out and be life on probation and parole. You got to pay fines and fees. You got to be on lifetime monitoring. Everything is profit driven and then oh you can't do this in certain states because you don't you got fines and fees so now you can't vote I don't, if that's not a poll tax i don't know what it is it's no different than those days where they made black people try to count marbles or re recite the constitution to be able to vote these are just ways to stop uh and to me i feel targets black people as it started with the poll tax the black codes back in the day to basically incentivize to get slaves because of the 13th Amendment, and that's why they exploited that 13th Amendment. And Dina hit on it real hard. When we was dealing with this stuff in the 80s with the crack people, everybody would go in jail if you was on crack. Now, since it's Heather and Aaron and, and Lil Jimmy, I hear addicted to meth and all this stuff. Now it's a public health crisis and they need treatment. And I'm not <laughs> saying that to be, I'm not saying that to be mean because I love my white brothers and sisters, but what I'm saying is I'm gonna call a spade a spade. When black folks is out here, on crack, my mom was addicted to crack for 25 years. And my mama really wanted help. She asked for help. She sought help. Nobody would give her the help that she needed. But I could see in the same situation, they would give her 10 years in prison because she went in the store and sold a bag of potato chips and some soap. But she yeah. would be caught with the same white woman. Was her and the same white woman used to get high all the time. But every time Mary Jane got sent to prison and the white lady always got to go to some type of treatment center to go and get done what she needed. And that's the you type know, of Alicia, thing to address. I'm going to say this, though. 
that what you're talking about is an upcoming show of disruptive dialogue because what you just shared is super important about how we we wrap our arms around people who have been impacted by the justice system or other systemic and structural barriers in order to keep them um, lifted up and help them move beyond the traumas that they've been impacted by, the drug use. Dina, you brought up alcoholism and everything else, the sicknesses that lead toward this. And one of the things you said, Walisha, is there are so many people inside prison industry that are doing high quality work. They never want to go back to prison, but they can't take this high quality work that they've been doing and make that translate to when they're free for their freedom to be able to support their, themselves as well as their families. And so it's important that we start to talk about ways that we can do that. Daphne, you had something you want to say. And then Lucretia, I'm going to come back to you and ask you about what's your experience with trying to bail people out through the bail project and that have, you know, lower crimes. And so we'll come back to you on that. But Daphne, go ahead. I just want to make a comment too with what Alicia said about um, the uh, income disparity when it comes to cases. Uh, and I'm just talking about me personally. Uh, I, When I was trying to uh, research on my own, I had an attorney, but I was researching cases, you know, that would help me and help my situation when I was going through court. And I found a case that was identical to mine, but the only difference was I was a private person and this was a hospital. We had done the same thing. And I asked my attorney, I said, well, what's the difference between me and them? He told me they have money. You don't. So mm. basically he told me, hey, you're not going to get away with just paying a fine like they did because you don't have the kind of money that they paid to wipe that on the, the counter. And, and that was sad. Yeah. And one other thing, when we were talking about different um, things that could be done, like in the federal system, they have what you call furloughs for people who are nonviolent, low, low, you know, low grade uh, far as um, disciplinary. Like me, I was I, I was considered out community. That was my status. I had no points because I had never done anything. So technically, by my status, I should have been in the community. But like I said, that money they were getting for me, they had me in a place that was like a college dorm with no fences, no gates. One guard was there per shift. You know, why were we there? You know, because right. it was a money thing. But they had what you call furloughs. And that would be another uh, thing. But they never hardly granted them because they didn't want to do the paperwork. That's another way to get mothers and kids connected. Even if they give them a day furlough to go to McDonald's or a day furlough to stay in the local area, you know, just to go and bond and do something with your kids. That is another way that that's already on the books that they're not even using as far as that can help um, maintain that family contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Lucretia, go ahead and speak to some of the experiences you've had um, with the Bell Project, with trying to bail people out who have these these nonviolent lower level offenses, and just the challenges of because they don't have money, they can't get out. Oh yeah, so um, I'm not sure if everybody familiar with the Bell Project. Um, it's a national nonprofit organization provide free bail assistance to those who are incarcerated. Um, so they are located in 30 cities across the United States. And here in Atlanta, we have uh, the cab in Fulton County and we have a separate team in Augusta, Georgia for Richmond County. And so um, I helped launch the Atlanta site uh, November 2020. And um, it's mind blowing to see the need for bail assistance. I have never seen anything like this until I got with the bail project. Um, you'd be surprised how many people um, need assistance to post bail. Uh, the families do not have it. Everyone do not own a home. Um, some people are not employed and, and, and they don't have the resources or the financial means uh, to go uh, get their loved ones out. Um, and some don't have the money to pay for anchor monitor. I remember why I used to was speaking on that, you know, um, you know, to pay for anchor monitor. And I'm like, why the county can't pay for it? You want to put an anchor monitor on somebody and you want to, you know, watch day every move you should pay for it you know um right. some and some some clients get get it paid by the county and some do not and then you have some clients um don't have housing and so that is another 
issue uh, because the big project would like for, you know, each client, we don't call them inmates, they would like for each client to have housing. Um, and housing can be staying at a hotel, it can be staying at a shelter or with a family or a friend, but we have to confirm housing. And also they have to have community support. What I do like about the Bell Project, even though they do provide free bail assistance, we do provide free cell phones. Um, it's not a smartphone, it's a flip phone, but we pay for it. So they don't have to worry about that. They can have the phone to stay in communication with their attorney or with the community or their families and loved ones and even jobs. We also provide free lift rides. So they got free transportation all on the Bell Project. Now, I don't know no other organization going to provide that, you know, free bail assistance, free phones and free transportation. That's a good deal. But, um, you know, some people we have to turn away because some of the bail amount. I, I had a call today. Uh, a bill amount was a million dollars and I was like blown. <laughs> I didn't even look up the case. <laughs> and I just, you know, returned the call and just share the bail amount is just too high. Unfortunately, we can't have this issue. Um, and so it's hard to give those type of calls or send those type of emails and text messages to those individuals because, you know, the family want to get that loved one out in spite of the situation because they are still um, innocent until proven guilty, you know? So, um, we, you know, don't pass judgment on anybody and we try to help as many people as possible. And so, so far I have posted about over 200 people so far, and it has been a wonderful experience. I have met so many great people, families and attorneys and community leaders and definitely connected with, while he's always sending me emails. I love it because it helps me to help my clients. So keep sending the emails for the jobs and the housing. Oh, one email you sent about like the identification, I want to talk about that because we, you know, we can't do everything. So we partner with organization and you sent out something. You have three of my clients. So shout out to you, you know, Lisa and Thomas always sending me information about housing and mental health. These are the things that people need. And you know, the sad part about it in Georgia, we have the highest amount of people on probation parole. That is totally ridiculous. And, and it, it can be probation non-reporting. It can be probation um reporting you know was you know ankle monitor restitution fees but georgia is all about the paper and it's time for a change is you know and the bell project whole model is to end cash bail so of course you know some bonding companies do not like us trust me <laughs> we get some backlashes like that's why i put in the chat many are called but only few are chosen to do this work and so i'm just grateful for this you opportunity know, thank you thomas you're welcome. I, you know, I didn't even think about what you just said as far as the backlash that you're going to get, because, you know, when you disrupt bail, you're disrupting a system of financial income. You know, it's like being on the streets. If if someone messes up your block and you can't make no money off it, that's some problems right there. And that's kind of, you know, these bail bondsmen and, and everybody else, they're going to push back because they don't want to see disruption of, of these systemic and structural barriers. Lisa, the bail industry comes, makes $24 billion a year. That's what it'll be. So of course, they're mad at anybody that wants to end the bail industry. Same right. thing with criminal justice reform <laughs> when you can get people out of right. prison. So you get backlash from the police because they think they're losing yeah. the job. You want to defund the police. You're getting backlash from people who work in the jails and prison system because you want to reduce the prison population. They, the first thing they're saying is, oh my God, I'm about to lose my job. People panic for no reason. As opposed to saying, well, you know what, maybe my job will no longer be a correction office in a prison, but maybe I can use this same opportunity to be some type of facilitator in a reentry type of thing. It's the same thing with homeless stuff. Everything is profited. A lot of folks really don't want folks in homeless uh, shelters to go and get their own housing. Because a lot of these homeless shelters will put on a limit saying that people can't work within a certain amount of time. They got to be in at a certain time. If you get a 3 to 11 job, they tell you to lose your bed. So some people go without looking for a job. That's not preparing people. That is because you are monetizing and tokenizing them and their body. So, of course, they, 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 we're going to get backlash. Do, do the, Is it right? I'm sure in their mind they got to know that this is really the right thing to do. We got somebody sitting in jail on a million dollar bond and it's, they probably didn't even kill nobody. You know, but hey, you know, it's money. And we got to also remember, too. These state legislators, these people who making these laws, they investing in the prison system too. So that's why we're getting a lot of backlash. People that invest yeah. in that. So you be yeah. imagine you doing it. That part right and there, I remember being inside of a private prison in, in Kansas and hearing the, the guards talk about stock splits that they're getting 
and everything else and how this was just, you know, wow, we're going to have some money right here, you know, because they were getting these stock incentives for being, in, um, you know, guards in these private prisons. And we have to realize that this isn't just a, a public um, thing. This is a, this is a public health challenge that most of us need to start to recognize and, and people who do not and have biases against people who've been incarcerated have to recognize that every person on here has had some kind of challenge in their life and on this call. But we're all overcomers and we're all doing things to make a big, significant difference um, in spite of, as Jesse would say, in spite of the challenges we face. Lisa, I just want to come to you really quick and talk about I want you to share with us some of the ways that you've you've thought about helping people overcome mental health challenges and um or and also housing challenges okay so um and just listening to everybody it's a lot to take in so with with like mental health and housing challenges um of course we are partner well my organization change gonna come has partnered with fathers matter atl and we work with the addressing the mass incarceration issue on that, along with um, Thomas and also Lucretia. And that's one of the things that we're doing, um, finding housing resources for people that are re-entering and that been impacted by the justice system in some type of way so that they don't end up going back because when they come out, there's nowhere for them to stay or they're getting a lot of pushback um, because they were incarcerated. So that's one of the things that we're working on with, within my organization and, and just the mental health piece, just being able to put myself in a position to be able to be of help to someone that's re-entering um, society and, and move them along the process to take the weight off of them. Because it can be very frustrating, especially when you're dealing with homelessness, when you're in that position and you don't have a place to go. That's a lot. That's a lot of stress, a lot of depression, just a lot of things that you need to go through. And then when you get the runaround, it just adds to it. So just really trying to put things in place so that that burden won't be be there um, for that particular person. And listen to Lucretia talk about the Bell Project, the reason that my organization um, even got involved with disrupting um, mass incarceration was because of the story of Khalif Browder. I don't know if anybody heard the story of the young man. He ended up killing himself. And it was all because he, his mom didn't have the money to bail him out. So he suffered greatly within the prison system. And when he came home, he just he was not able to handle it. So he did um, take his life. So that story really impacted me. And, you know, that's why I, find, why I find myself in this space, because I really do want to do something about that and just listen at the fact that the prisons are making money off of the prisoners, but no one is getting help in, you know, in that system. And the systems are designed to keep you in the system. I, I, got, I received a ticket maybe a year ago and I couldn't pay. So I was on probation. And the best thing that happened was I was able to pay. <laughs> The ticket, I was like, what is going on here in Georgia? Like, this is what they do when you can't pay your ticket, you get it, you put on probation. But it just gave me some insight on the system and how it, it once you win there, you're in there, you know, so to speak. And it's kind of, it's hard to get out. Thank God I was able to pay eventually. But, you know, you're, you don't have the money to pay the ticket. You go to court, you get on probation when you didn't have the money to pay the ticket, now you're on probation, you got to pay your probation officer when I didn't have the money to pay my ticket. And I, I'm still responsible for that ticket. So I see how easy it is to get caught up just with something simple as, you know, speeding, just with something that simple. So it's really, for me, it's just making the process of those entering to re-enter into society, making the process easier. And just from listening to all you ladies, it's, it's like another thing I want to add to my organization as to how I can, my organization can help women in prison to make that process easier and, and let people be held accountable for their actions against women and men that come through the prison system just because they're in the prison system. I think while Alicia mentioned earlier how dogs are treated better. And I think we know in our society, this is true. Dogs are treated better. 
and and just being able to aid in that process to stop some of the things that are going on. I realize it's it's a fight, but right now it's like I'm out here now, so it's something that I'm willing to um, deal with and go through because it's just a sad situation just to hear the stories that you women have shared about your different experiences going in the system. And I know just being in the system of homelessness, they don't make it so that you will get out. It's set up so that you can like get your head above water, but eventually you're going to find your way back in there. And the people that's really making the money are the people that's running the facilities, even if they are stealing the money from you. So, you know, they really don't care about those that they were sent there to help. Yeah, I don't even call it ass backwards anymore, Thomas. I call it back asswards. Because <laughs> if a person, seriously, if a person cannot pay a $100 speeding ticket and you turn around and out of the $100 speeding ticket, they got another $300 in court right. fees. Now they got probation fees. Now the entire bill is $1,000. If I can't pay you a hundred, what in the hell make you think I can pay a thousand? pay you a thousand. Right. They're going to, they're going to try to keep you in there. And, and that's the whole thing is the system is, has never really been for people. Give it a chance and let's see if we could turn things around and start to see how people who are incarcerated are not, everyone's not the, the enemy. Everybody does not deserve to be in prison forever. Um, you know, I, I'm going to start to wrap this up, but I, I want us to really recognize all of you all because you all are the examples of what it means to to really be to experience some of the most harshest climates in this in this country, and then come out and just be superstars and 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 really champions for so many people. Jesse, I want to, I want you to say a couple things, uh, you know, take a minute or so, because I, even though all you all are examples, Jesse, I want to talk to you a second because you spent so much time in prison and you got out and you are a light. You are a person that I 100% believe in. Not every single one of you are, but I want to, I trust you to the point where when you work for, with my organization, I have no concern whatsoever. And I want you to share the heartbeat behind someone like yourself who you're not that bad person. You're not the person that society wants to, you know, the, the way the society labels, but you have this heartbeat. Tell us what makes your heartbeat and the kind of impacts you're making and what you think people should know about people who've been incarcerated. I think the main thing people should know about women that have been incarcerated, because I can only speak to the female population, okay. is that we are more than what we've done. And we have skills that we have already attained before we come to prison. And a lot of us are trying to take those skills and make them marketable again upon our release. My heartbeat comes from not being a stereotype. And as a black woman, we are constantly being stereotyped. I am not what you make me out to be. I'm a human being. I'm not some beast, some violent beast. I just did 27 years for a second degree murder. And I'm not some violent beast. I wasn't violent in prison. I wasn't violent before prison. And I am not violent now. I'm educated. I want to make a difference. And I will make a difference in spite of everything that is thrown in. In spite of what you say I'm supposed to be. And I'll say it again, my child is not what society says she would become. My grandchildren are not what society says they would become. I am not what society says I would become upon my release. In spite of the fact that they, they've done nothing to help me, I found a way to help myself and found my community like me to support me. My heart becomes from the fact that I am more than what I did. And I prepared my life in those 27 years you know how they say you have to stay ready so you don't have to get ready? That's what I did. And I hit the ground running because I intend to make a difference until the day I die and beyond because I want to leave a legacy. I want to show sisters coming out of prison that you can thrive, not survive. You can thrive. And I want to help them find those wraparound sources that I had to crawl to find. But praise God, within a year, I did find them because I came from Ohio to Atlanta. And even though I had this packet like this thick 
telling me all the resources that were available for me in Atlanta prior to leaving prison, only about one item out of that thickness, which was about 30 pages, guys, only one item was accurate. Not helpful when you're coming out of prison, trying to reintegrate into society. Not helpful at all. My heartbeat comes from what I know you don't have when you come out. And I intend to find the resources that I like are better in this room right now. And we have to come together as a force and make it possible, not just for women, but for men as well, when they come out. Because the, we're designed to fail to come out. My heart yeah. becomes from the fact that I'm not going to fail regardless of what you do. In spite of what you throw at me, I'm not going to fail. I did not fail while I was inside. I will not fail now. I might stumble, but I'm not going to fail. 27 years in, that gave me the skill set I needed to make it once I got out. I left Ohio with the ability to vote. I got here and they snatched it from me. They snatched it from me because when you get out of uh, prison in Ohio, you can vote immediately. Welcome to the South, baby. Hmm. I got here. I was so shocked when I got that letter telling me that my rights had been taken from me. Okay, you can have my rights. Well, then I'm going to do whatever I can to encourage people to vote. I'm, you can't. Okay, you took that in spite of what you're saying. I can't do. I'm going to do my part to make sure other people do vote. How about that? Until That's I can good. vote. You can't take things from me. You can't tell me I can't do something because I'm going to find a way around it. Yeah. And I only want to be around people that are doing the same. My heartbeat comes from in spite of. In spite of, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make Powerful. it happen and I'm going to be a part of the change. Powerful. You know, Jesse, I'm telling you, you are a lightning rod and I appreciate you. Now, we're getting ready to wrap up. We got a couple minutes left. I just want to give anyone that has a final word, a couple 20 second word for anybody that you want to share. Um, I just want to ahead. share about an event that's coming up. It's for okay. it's called Out of Isolation. It's uh -huh. coming up on uh, the Saturday, the third and the fourth, but uh, specifically the Saturday, the third at the Southern Center for Human Rights office. It is for women who have been impacted by solitary confinement. It is a free event. Um, if you are interested in attending, it'll be 12 up to two at the Southern Center's office. Um, and we are welcoming of women who have been impacted in solitary confinement. Um, so if you're interested, just email P Dukes, P as in Paul, D as in David, U as in up, K as in kite. Oh, I hate to say it. kite. E as in elephant, S as in Sam at schr.org. We would love to have you. I'll be there as well. I'm a survivor of solitary confinement and we would love to uh, hang out with you as well. And also to let folks know that in Georgia, you can vote with a felony. You just cannot be on probation or parole. Good stuff. Good stuff. All you ladies have so much going on. You know, I can talk about Offenders Alumni Association. Daphne, I could talk about uh, Every Mother Matters. Is it? Wait, wait. It's the Mothers Matter. Incarcerated Mothers Incarcerated Matter. Incarcerated Mothers <laughs> Matter. I knew it was right there on my tongue. <laughs> but um, and then everybody, you just all have things going on. You know, I want to say I'm so grateful again to be able to listen to you. And that's what I want everybody to do is take away the some of the things that you're sharing and realize that there are there are solutions to everything that you share. For every problem, there is a solution. And I'm grateful that I had a chance to listen and just listen to ways my organization can support what you all are doing. But I think your work and your voice needs to be elevated also. And that's the reason why we started with Ladies First. That's why my podcast was, was dedicated to this, because the way we start is the way I want to continue on. And I believe that as ladies continue to be elevated, especially Black women who have been challenged throughout the history of this country, um, get a chance to be elevated, it's important. I want to highlight something that I highlighted in the beginning, that since 1980, between 1980 and 2020, the rate of incarceration increased 475% for women. And that just says that they're, this country is not really meeting the needs. They're not meeting until, you know, meeting the needs that, as they're going. So um, I really appreciate you all sharing. Um, one last comment, anybody? Thank ahead, you Dan. for having us and allowing um, our voices to be heard in this space to share our lived experience, not what we think, but what we know with um, 
the public at large so that they can really know the truth, our truth, uh, which is the ultimate truth. It, it is because we've lived it, not that we're thinking about it or anything like that. But I really appreciate being in this space with all the hearts that are on this line. Ladies, uh, I really want to honor you for the work that you all are doing throughout this country in order to make someone else's life better and their path a little bit smoother. And Thomas, again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You know, we have a friend that often says, those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Glenn Mark. I believe that all of you all are closest to the solution. So um, I want to thank all of you all for As joining us for Disruptive Dialogue. And I want to thank the audience for sitting in and listening to Disruptive Dialogue. It's been amazing uh, first season. These ladies have really impacted the way our work is going to go as, as an organization. Um, their voice needs to be elevated. Reach out to them. Find their links in the bio um, or in the comment section. I want to make sure that they are out there, support their work, support their organizations. They are doing amazing things. They are making a difference in families, communities, and this country. So uh, thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next season.